It is a joy to be here. Some of you have absolutely no idea who I am. Some of you do, but my name is um, Tommy Who, W-H-O. Some of you have absolutely no idea, but I was here for a season in the life of the church, and I love Berlin Baptist Church. Some of the best people I know, except for Troy, um, some of the best people I know are members of Berlin Baptist Church. And I want to thank you for staying in touch with us on Facebook. can be a blessing, can be a curse, but it's a blessing being able to keep up with so many of you and what's going on in your life. Most of you probably knew I was coming, and you were praying I would bring Lucy along with me. Well, that was the plan, but Lucy's mother has a situation that requires Lucy to be there, so she could not be with us, but wanted to send her love and regards to you, and to let you know that she is so excited that today, that she and I have been married for 46 years. Amen? That's a good deal. So, uh, we're great. I'm honored that Pastor Mike would trust me with the pulpit. Um, I never... Um, I've let people that I didn't know well or trusted to, to serve in a, a pulpit that I was a pastor of, and I'm just so thrilled. And Darlene's here to take notes and make sure that I do it right so she can report back to him. Some of you have asked the question, what am I doing now? Now, I want you to understand, for some of you Clemson people, I want you to figure this out. Now, Larry Taylor Mike can do it. You know, Scott back there can probably do it. I have been 50 years old for 21 years. So um, I have retired as pastor of First Baptist Gaffney. If this wasn't on live service, I'd tell you why. No, um, I just felt the time was right for me. I, I, I was 70 at the time. That's not a magical age, but I retired. But I'm still involved in ministry. Um, I, a pastor never retires. I have been speaking, I've been in mission trips, and I want to give you an opportunity. This is, uh, I didn't ask Mike's permission, he can give me a whipping later, but I think that somewhere along the way I may have sent him some brochures about what Lucy and I are doing. For 50 years, I listened to people come to a pulpit and say, well, I want to tell you about this book I had to sell. Well, I don't have a book to sell. I don't have any um, pictures to sign. I'm just saying that you would be interested in praying for our ministry. It's called Kingdom First Living. Um, I do not ask for money. Um, the only thing I ask for people to pray and do anything that God would have them to do. There's no salary involved. So this is a ministry that Lucy and I are involved in. She's in charge of the prayer aspect of it. And I do the, the preaching and the, the going and stuff like that. So I'm going to do something, Darlene, if I get in trouble um, you, you bail me out. But I'm going to put these brochures here. And if you'd like to, if you're, in, if you're interested, don't just say, well, we're, just look at them. But you can partner with us. And um, if not, you can just on take a piece of paper now and just, um, you know, put your name and address, your name, email, and phone number. And we'll put you on our prayer team. And what that means is we send out periodically prayer requests because I believe that God does nothing except through prayer. And you've heard me say that many times. I don't believe God does anything except through prayer. Study in Scripture and you see where God is working through prayer. So if you'd like to do that, um, please um, take one, pray about it, share with other folks, and that would be a blessing to us. Well, today, for the next couple of hours, A, let me talk to you for a minute. I look at your services. I don't always acknowledge I'm watching. Um, y'all don't get out in an hour. And I'm going to mess this mic up, Amy. Look at here. Okay. Y'all don't get out in an hour. I think the Pastor Mike, he comes up and shares with you what he wants you to share. Then we stop. Well, I won't keep you for a couple of hours. But I want to just um, share with you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 23. As you're doing this, I, I, do, I promise you that Lucy and I, we pray for you, and I am very honored to be here. And all I'm going to I'm ask you a question that every person in this room has to answer, whether it be um, online watching in this building, 
Every person in this room has to a- answer the question, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? In other words, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I'm not asking you if you're a Christian. And I'll talk about that in just a few moments. I'm asking you, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? In Luke chapter 9, earlier Jesus is performing miracles. He's talking about His death and burial and resurrection, that He is going to go to a cross, and there Jesus will shed His blood. He will give His life for us. He will be resurrected, and then He will become King of kings and Lord of lords. And He gives us the great privilege when He allows us to follow Him. Then He said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save him. For what profit is to a man if he gains the whole world and in himself is destroyed or lost? For, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father and the holy angels. Verse 23, Then he said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day that we have to enter into your house to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, you know the truth of the matter is, you know where each one of us are spiritually, most likely in the church of this size, we're in this room, and we're in different levels of spiritual maturity. But Father, I pray that when we leave this place, there's not a person in this room, there's not a person watching by live stream who could ever deny whether or not they know you as a personal Savior through Jesus Christ. Please take this, your unworthy servant, Would you hide me behind the cross of Calvary? Lift up Jesus, and we claim the promise. If he be lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. Thank you, Father, for what you're about to teach us. And I thank you for those who are going to be set free this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Are you a follower of Jesus? The older I've gotten through the years, I realize that's what it's all about. And I make it condense it. Are you a Jesus follower? Do you follow Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of your life? Because I'm finding the more that I travel, the more that I'm involved with other people's lives, so many folks are confused about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because we've been told, if I'm a church member, and I've gone through all the things the church requires, I've been baptized, I, I serve God, I do the religious works, I believe God. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about has there been a time in your life when you've said, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, I'm lost, I repent of my sin. Jesus, you come into my heart and be my Savior and my Lord. We know the heart of the gospel is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We also know the motive of the gospel is found in Second Peter 3, 9, when the Bible says that God is not happy, God intends for his will, is for everyone to have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why he sent Jesus to give us life, and to give it more abundantly. That's the motive of the gospel. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. For the truth of the matter is this. All of us who have ever breathed, we're going to spend eternity somewhere forever. To those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we're going to spend all eternity in heaven. And I think about some of the folks in this church that I'm looking forward to seeing in heaven. A lot of them, I'm looking forward to see Sally Yon. Sally threatened to cut me. My first time I met her, she says, I will cut you. And then Willie Gant, you know, Willie 
what a gracious guy he was. A lot of the folks in this church who are with the Lord, but if you know Jesus, you're going to spend all eternity with Him. But if not, you will spend all eternity apart from God because you re- rejected Jesus, and you will spend all eternity in a place called hell. Hell is real. It's a place. It's not just an imagination place. It's a place that the Bible teaches. Thirdly, the atoning death of Jesus has made it possible for us to have a relationship with God. Now, my concern today is the culture in which we live. If you listen to the news, you listen to other people, and they are challenging our youth, your children, your grandchildren, our younger generation with lies. I believe biblically that Satan is using even those in the church to spread lies about God that simply are not true. The first one is that we're all going to heaven. Excuse me, the first one is we're all God's children. I hear that so often. You listen to politicians. If you've been to a baccalaureate service of any kind, you'll hear someone say, well, we're all God's children. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, that is a lie. We are not all God's children. We're all created in the image of God, but we're not all God's children. The Bible makes it clear even from the lips of Jesus. When Jesus said, you are of your father the devil, those who have never placed their trust in Jesus Christ. So we're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. Why would Jesus die? Why would it be necessary if we're all God's children? Secondly, that we're all going to heaven. Um, I've heard that we're all going to heaven. No, we're not. And that song, Amy, that we sing, When We All Get to Heaven, I love that song. But I want to tell you, it's just for Christians. Because lost people cannot say, when we all get to heaven. So when we all get to heaven, what a glorious time that's going to be. But Satan has begun to work even among church people to say, well, if we're all God's children and we're all God going to heaven, why should I be be so serious about this man called Jesus? Thirdly, the lie is that there are many ways to God. Many ways to God. Now we're all on a journey. God is up there. And there's a lot of ways to get to Him. Jesus said from His own lips, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Some would say, well, you know what? Um, I believe that if you just live a good life and you treat your wife and husband and children, find your neighbor, all that's going to matter. Well, it might matter on earth, but I'm going to tell you, when Jesus said, now listen to me, I didn't say this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father except by me. So I'm asking you a personal question. Are you a follower of Jesus? And then some folks in our culture, and I'll probably get booed out of here, but you know what, when you're my age, I don't really care. <laughs> I really don't care. Like a, maybe earlier I would have. But some folks will say, you know what, well, about involvement in the local church. I've never heard so much mistruth and misrepresentation that I'm finding in the culture today. The culture tells us, you know, church is a nice place, but you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, and they're exactly right. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But because you are a Christian and you're able to be in church, you should be in the house of God. Now, I understand about COVID. A lot of folks are still scared to death of over COVID. Instead of living by faith, what many people are still living by fear. Churches are empty. I want to commend you with your pastor being gone and Patty being gone. You got, you're well represented. A lot of churches are just empty pews because somewhere along the way, someone has said to them, well, if you go to church with all those people, you're going to catch COVID. All right. Ask a question. 
Anybody been to Walmart lately? I want to tell you that place is packed. Anybody been to a football game or a baseball game? Those ball fields are absolutely packed. You go to other places and people are there. The Bible says, For sake not the assembling of yourselves together, which is the custom of some. If I am going to be a follower of Jesus, and Jesus is the master of the church, if I am physically able to be in the house of God, I believe biblically that's what God tells us to do. Now, I understand online, I mean this online stuff, I was the pastor of First Baptist of Gaffney. I remember going to a building and the three people, me, the um, sound person, and the music. And we would do a, a radio broadcast. We'd do live stream because people needed access to the gospel. And that's all the online is. It does not take the place of being in the house of God. Could he get a witness on that? Or don't boo me out now yet, all right? But think about that for a minute. We'll do all these things, and yet when it comes to church, we want to... I ain't going to go there. I'm, I'm starting to meddle. Anyway, that's not of God. I know there are folks at Berlin Baptist Church and every church I have ever served in who are unable to be in the house of God. I respect that. I really do. I really do. But our problem is when those who are willing to be in church, choose not to be in the house of God. So that's what our culture is teaching us. But God has made it easy for us to become believers. He sent Jesus. The Holy Spirit begins to draw us to Himself. He's given us a way to have a relationship with Him. But many folks in the church are just depending upon church membership rituals, religion, good life, good things, as opposed to having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And can I tell you this morning, every one of you in this room, everyone watching by live stream, you know whether or not you are a child of God. You know you may have other folks fooled, but you know whether or not you are a born-again believer. What would happen if Pastor Mike decided he was going to take a one-on-one -on -one with every member of Berlin Baptist Church? Every member, one-on-one, -on -one, just you and him, and he's going to ask you a question, are you a Jesus follower? Are you a follower of, the, of Jesus? He's not going to ask you, are you a church member? Have you been baptized? all your theological um, beliefs, he's going to ask you, are you a follower of Jesus? Can I tell you, his, the response would be, some would say, I do not have a relationship with God, and I know it. I'm, I, 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 I'm a member of the church. I mean, I, I know, I'll know i be the rest of God. I do not have a relationship with God, and I know it. Because when you become a Christian, the Bible says, all, we, become, we become new creations. All things have passed away. Secondly, some would say, well, I do not have a relationship with God, but I think I do. Now, what do you mean I think I do? Well, I'm involved in religious activity. I have a religious performance. a matter of fact, I came to Vacation Bible School. I came to a youth event, child event. I came to revival. And I walked down the aisle of the church. I gave my hand to a, a preacher. But really, I never gave my heart to Jesus. I gave my hand and said, Preacher, but I never gave my heart to Jesus. Even though I prayed the prayer, I just it wasn't real. It's just something I did. And then what happens is, I think I am, because someone keeps reminding you that you made that decision. Oh, I remember when you were in Sunday school class. I remember when you were this and that. But you know this morning whether or not you are a follower of Jesus. That means that you have a relationship with God. Thirdly, some would say, I do, but sometimes I doubt it. 
We always seem to doubt our salvation when we are facing a moment of failure. When I give in to sin, I have a disappointment, some things take place in my life, and I'm saying, God, I cannot believe I would ever do something like that. And we just go on through life, and we doubt our salvation. Well, the great news in 1 John, God wants us to be sure and to know that we have eternal life, and it's all in Jesus Christ. Because it is in, someone say, I doubt it. And listen to me, I've talked to some of you through the years about this issue, about doubting your salvation. Here's the deal. It is spiritually impossible for you to be unborn. If you're born again of the Spirit of God, it is spiritually impossible to be unborn. It's just like my kids come to me and say, Daddy, can I be your child today? How absurd. So listen, you're always going to be my child. And that's the same with God. If you know Jesus, you're always going to be a child of God. And some of you, Satan, has got into your mind because you fail, and we all fail because you sin, we all sin, that you're not a believer. That is not the truth that your pastor speaks about and the truth of Scripture. So would say, I do have a relationship, but there are times in my life when I doubt Him. And then I am confident that I do. And those of you in this room and say, um, I know, I know, I know, without any hesitation, there's a time in my life when I gave my heart to Jesus. And I am saved, I am sanctified, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm just rejoicing in the glory of a relationship I can have with God. Billy Graham said, Billy Graham said, that the greatest mission field of our day is the local church. Many of us thinking we're saved when we really say, you know what, there's no evidence. You mean to tell me someone can become a Christian when they're 15, 16 years old? Have no desire for spiritual matters, no desire to be around God's people, and they can be born again. I can't judge. I'm just sharing what the Scripture has to say. So in our closing moments, I want to just share with you what does it look like to be a Jesus follower. There ought to be evidence that I'm walking with Jesus. I'm not perfect. Only one perfect person. He was nailed to a cross for your sin and for mine. As Jesus begins the journey to Jerusalem, as He begins His journey to the cross, He looks at these guys and He says to me, Men, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There is the choice of lordship. It is an individual choice. The Bible is filled with whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No one can make that decision for you. I want to tell you, if I can make a decision for anybody who was lost, no one would ever be lost. It's a decision that only you can make. It is intentional. It's just an intention. I'm saying, God, um, as you draw me to yourself, I'm prompted by the Holy Spirit. I am individually and I intentionally give my heart to Jesus. But there's something that we need to understand that this relationship is initiated by God. We don't just wake up one morning and say, you know what? I think I want to be a Christian. I think I want to be saved. It doesn't happen quite that way. In John 6, 44, Jesus said, No one comes to the Father unless they are drawn by Him to me. What that means is that God chooses us so that we can choose Him. You're lost in sin, but you hear the glorious gospel of how you're, what God can save you and give you everlasting life, abundant life, but you know you're, you're filled with the guilt of sin, and then God draws you to Himself, and you say yes to Jesus. You pray, Dear Jesus, come into my heart. I repent of my sin. Be my Savior and my Lord. I heard a, a preacher talk the other day, and he made one statement that I really caught my attention. He says, man, 
may have the permission to believe the gospel. All of us can believe that God sent Jesus the whole gospel. But the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the ability to receive Jesus. You do not receive Jesus based upon your own reaction. I mean, excuse me, your own motives, your own desire, or somebody else. But you individually, intentionally, initiated by God, you say yes to Him. So in that context, are you a Jesus follower? Now you say, well, you're, you're speaking to the choir. I would not think so. Some of us in this room really probably need to look in the mirror of grace and determine once and for all, am I truly a follower of Jesus? And not try to pretend, not try to base on performances, but just say, I am a child of God. Secondly, there is the condition of lordship. You notice everything we're talking about lordship. Jesus said, let him deny himself. Bonhoeffer says that we are to die to ourselves. Flesh is the enemy of our faith. Many of us in this room remember the song. Um, you may like Frank Sinatra's version, or you might like um, Elvis Presley's version of My Way. Burger King tells us to have it your way, my way. It doesn't happen like that. Self is the greatest enemy to the Christian. When we realize in our own lives that we can't blame others for the decisions that we make. In Galatians 5.24, Paul says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The flesh will do anything before it will die. It will preach, it will teach, it will sing, it will play, it will serve, it will go, it will give. The self will do anything before it will die. But Jesus says, if you're going to be a follower of mine, you must be willing to die to yourself. Jesus set the example in the Garden of Gethsemane. As our Lord is agonizing in the flesh, but He realizes in the Spirit, He is man, but He is God. And He says, Oh, dear Father, in my flesh, if there's any other way, so let it be. And there was no other way for our salvation except the life, the blood of Jesus being shed. But He said, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. I do a lot of prayer walking. Somebody says they think I've lost a little bit of weight. Well, I don't know about that, but I do a lot of prayer walking. I mean, I, if you go to Gaffney, I'm referred to as the, the praying, the walking preacher. Well, I was walking one day almost to the end of town and praying for our, for our city for revival, and I noticed there was a sign that said self, S-E-L-F. And I said, wow. I'm sure that street was named after somebody whose last name was Self. But then my mind began to think. I said, Lord, I wonder how many folks in the local church live on Self Street. It's all about them. What they want, what they feel, got to have it, you know, my way, all those things. But the Self is an enemy to where we, where we, we need to be spiritually. So God wants us... When Jesus says, if you go be my disciple, you're going to follow me, you must be willing to deny yourself. We pick up our cross in a relationship. But Spurgeon said, I said earlier, that self is the Christian's greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy may not even be your addiction. It may not be your attitude. Your biggest uh, enemy is you. You choosing to live your life for yourself. Then he says... You deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean? That we pick up our cross. It's a relationship with God. It's more than just a piece of jewelry. We follow the example of Jesus. And Paul gives us an example that we are to follow in our lives. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. 
and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. In Romans 6, 4, the Bible says that we are buried with Him through baptism, raised up together to walk in the newness of life. Uh, Romans 6, 6, the old man has been crucified. John the Baptist said that he, meaning Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. Can I ask you a question? Do you live on Self Street? Is it all about you? What you want? I was here four and a half years. And some of you probably wanted it your way. Mike didn't have that problem. Mike's got it all, all taken care of. On Self Street, you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. So you pick up your cross, but it's more to it than just picking up your cross. It is getting on the cross. We must be willing to get on the cross because salvation is a one-time decision. I don't have to wake up every moment and say, God, can I be your child? That's secure through the blood of Jesus. But lordship is a decision I make every day. Lord, I want you to be the, I deny my mind. I deny my will, my emotions, Lord. I want to get on the cross and stay to be crucified with Christ. Now, Jesus was mocked. He was humiliated. He was spit upon. He was slapped. He was just all kinds of horrible things. The crown of thorns was placed upon his head and the thief on the cross and those around him. They said, Jesus, you saved others. Why don't you come down and save yourself? Jesus, you saved others. Why don't you come down and save yourself? In essence, why don't you just come down from the cross? It's not necessary for you to give your life. Just come down and live your life as we are living our lives. And I'm confident in your life and in my life. The world tells us to come down. Come off the cross. Don't take this religious stuff so seriously. Don't take your, rela your relationship with God so seriously. And what happens is, even young people in this room, you know what I'm talking about? When the world tells you to come down, go ahead and compromise the Word of God. Just, you know, the Word of God is just an old book. It doesn't mean much. Just compromise the Word of God. That's our problem in the nation. Compromising our morals. Living together outside of marriage, premarital sex, homosexuality, the transgender, now um, Miss, whatever it is, Miss Netherlands, um, transgender, was um, voted upon as Miss Netherlands, and whatever that, whatever that person is, is going to compete in the Miss Universe. I can't wait to see that, can you? Think about it, come down to just compromise your morals, your commitment. You want to get revenge against somebody? I tell you, come down from the cross and slander them and talk about them, all those things. When you want to be critical, come down from the cross and speak untruths and just get your word in because you know what? You, you want to do it anyway. When you're, when you're worrying, and the Jesus tells us that worry is a sin, we come down from the cross when we worry and we're not trusting God. We give in the temptation. No one will ever know. We become disconnected from the church. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, deny us, pick up your cross, deny yourself, get on the cross, stay on the cross. Don't come down. Don't let the world and the values of the world allow you to compromise. You be willing to simply be faithful to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So totally surrendered to the will of God. Totally surrendered to the will of God. And then lastly, come and follow me. There is the call or the command, come and follow me. We're following a person. We're following Jesus. We're, he's the top priority in our lives. We are following His purpose. And the song in just a moment we're going to sing, Wherever He leads, I'll go. Wherever He leads, I'll go. Remember a time in the life of Jesus when folks were beginning to say, Well, I will follow Him. Maybe for you, 
and maybe in my time in my life, when we say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. You can count on me. I'm going to die with you. And Peter made those statements, and Jesus said before the, the cock crows three times, you have denied me in this room, watching. There are those of us who can relate to the, the, the passage. Here, listen to what the Bible says. Now, what happened as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Have you ever made that decision? I will follow you wherever you lead me. I will not compromise my morals. I will not compromise my convictions. I will not compromise lordship. And then Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And when this, the comfort's gone, the people are gone. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And then another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So God calls us, and God calls us sometimes into adversity. Think about Job. God calls us in the time when we're able to renew our commitment. But God's calling us today. So in every sermon, every sermon you hear, every teaching you hear, there are, are three components that are so important. First of all, there is biblical information. I've shared with you biblical information. I didn't say that, you know, um, Tommy said this or Berlin Baptist said this. This is what Jesus says. None of us have a right to take the Word of God and make it say what we want it to say. And then there is divine inspiration. How we look at so many folks in our lives who have lived the Christian life before us and they've modeled what it has meant to be a Christian. We rejoice in the inspiration that we get from them. And then thirdly, there is always application. All of us in this room, whether you sit there and say, well, this is not for me, whatever it might be, you're going to make a decision. Because personal application is where lordship takes place. We can have all the information, we can have all the inspiration, but until there is a personal application, they're just words. So this morning, as we close, as we close, could I ask you that question just one more time? Because I realize that this could be the last time I would speak in this pulpit, last time I'm ever going to speak. But I'm so concerned and passionate as I would look at your life, could you say, I am a Jesus follower? Would you say no? But you sense right now that the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Himself? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's drawing you to Himself so that you can know without any hesitation that you're a child of the King. Don't let your past, don't let sin, don't let anything rob you of the moment that God is giving you now. But you would say, I am a believer and I thank God for salvation. But there are times in my life there are times in my life when I come down from the cross and I try to live things out my way. I try to figure things out as opposed to faith in things out. I'm convinced I'm nobody, that God doesn't love me. That would be another spiritually impossibility that God would never love you. If God never loved you, you would be the first person that would ever happen to. But God loves us. And God gives us an opportunity to follow Him by faith. God forgives us. God forgives us. So very simply, are you a follower of Jesus? I don't use the word Christian as much as I used to because of the reasons I gave you. If you say I'm a Christian, oh yeah, you know what, I've done all these things. You narrow it down to saying, 
I am a follower of Jesus and that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen? Do you get it? Let's pray.